uh, we welcome you to today's program. We'll be talking about something that is a challenge for most uh, startups and uh, that are of the hardware nature is moving a product from prototype to manufacturing. And we are excited today to have today's guest. I did want to provide a little bit of context. So networks matter. So if you're wondering why am I meeting all these people and um, and maybe connecting with them on LinkedIn or whatever the your networking tool of choice is, is that you never know when those networks may merge and you'll be able to provide people with, uh, pr provide that network effect where people who are have mutual interests can um, be connected with one another. So we were really, uh, we're grateful to one of our friends uh, who was in the research park for a long time, Howard Gerwin, uh, who worked at John Deere Technology Innovation Center, was uh, connected via his professional networks to uh, Anna Thornton and thought that we probably had some mutual interests uh, around advancing our startup ecosystem to move forward um, manufacturing of hardware products. And that I will not read to you Anna's bio. I believe that we have that posted on our website, but needless to say, she has decades of experience in this uh, very unique uh, um, vertical of advancing companies um, to help them move uh, from prototype into manufacturing. So Anna's joining us today from the East Coast. She showed us her farm in Vermont where she is, but she is a faculty member at Boston University. So uh, we are very grateful. She does have Midwest roots though, as I learned that she grew yeah. up in Missouri. So, and she says it like my dad does, who also grew up in Missouri. So that's how I knew it was authentic. Yeah, um, so exactly. <laughs> so most without people further Boston, ado. Yeah, most people in Boston look at me weird when I say Missouri, but those who are in the Midwest, it's, we're, I'm part of the tribe. Yes. Uh, Exactly. So, uh, so welcome uh, today, um, Anna, and we're happy to have you. And for those of you who might have joined us a little bit in the last few minutes, um, as Anna mentioned, she'd love to see if you have any questions up front off the bat. Um, and so we will, I will probably cue in. Um, Anna, I know it's hard to watch the chat when you are presenting as well. So if we do get some questions um, in, in the chat or directly to me, I will, I will prompt you with them. So Feel free to take it away. Great, and feel free to interrupt me um, anytime as we go through this process. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of presenting some lessons learned from my experience in hardware startups, um, and uh, I'm hoping that what we can do is, you know, if you have specific questions, I'm happy to rearrange sort of how I'm focusing the talk uh, to make sure that. Um, you guys get the benefit of the talk and it focuses on the problems you're having today. Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, it did the slide change for you. Okay, I'm on a new computer and it's not behaving the same way as my old computer. So, um, so a little background. I mean, these are sort of the this is sort of the pictorial graphic of where I've been and who I am and what I do. Um, I started life as an academic. I was a professor at MIT. I then went into industry and worked for about 15 years with a startup company, a startup consulting firm, uh, and helped grow that. And I got to play with all sorts of really cool companies there, everything from Boeing to white goods to bicycle parts. Um, I then transitioned into the startup space for several years with Dragon Innovation. Uh, where I helped companies go into production in China. Um, and it was really a chance for me to step back from the corporate, more management consulting side of things where I spent a lot of time on the factory floor, but really see what it meant to actually happen on a day-to-day. -day. Um, okay, great. Uh, Vara, I will definitely focus on that. Um, so what I want to, you know, it's, so I spent a bunch of time actually doing the work um, and living in the shoes or living with the uh, startup companies um, and helping get that launched. Um, about four years ago, I joined Boston University uh, as a professor of the practice, which means that I get to um, teach only. I don't have to have actual research projects. Um, and I teach a number of courses there, including additive manufacturing, product realization, and then our undergraduate manufacturing process class. Um, Laura, you may actually not know this yet, but I was just named director of EPIC, which is our manufacturing um, and product design center. So I'll be sort of 
doing more interesting things in that space. Um, and now I actually have the title to, to be able to do that. Um, so one of the sort of impetuses for this talk was a book I just recently published called Product Realization, Going from One to a Million, uh, where I took a lot of my lessons learned from big companies and small companies, uh, mainly because uh, I wrote the book because I was developing a course and nobody had actually written down how to do any of this stuff. Um, there was nothing where I could go to teach students about bill of materials or color material finished con uh, documents or how to do supply chain management. So all those things that my startup companies needed and I couldn't find articles for them to go and read. So I ended up having to teach them. Um, and so that became, I started writing things up and then eventually had the textbook. Um, and that textbook again was published this last January. Um, so this is Epic. This is the place, uh, just kind of a little pitch for what we do at BU. Um, we have a very, um, we, we try and merge both the theory with the practice and Epic is that space where theory and practice come and intersect. This is a space where our students really get to embody the designs that they're doing. Um, it's just down the street from our innovation center. It's just a very short walk down to the, the innovation center. Um, and so we do a lot of this cross functional work between startups and um, actually building prototypes. Um, and then again, this is a, we serve about 1500 students a year. It's a 15,000 square foot um, maker space, but it's more than a maker space. It's actually almost a job shop. Um, we've got every toy you could imagine. It's, it's an engineer's dream to be able to play in that space. Um, so let's talk about product realization. And it sounds like this is what you guys are interested in learning about, which is, what is that process of going from this works like looks like prototype, you've got CAD, you've got some components, there's a lot of wire sticking out of it, it's not very pretty, um, and you end up, how do you get from there to something that's beautiful on the shelf that you can deliver to the customer, that the customer can use reliably without you sitting there over their shoulder? Um, and what does that process looks lo look like? So how do we get between these two processes? And most of our courses actually focus either on the front end or the back end. And one of the reasons why I developed this course and, and wrote this book on this topic is, is it seems like this is the last bit of engineering where we do this on a, um, an apprenticeship basis. So most people learn it by going into a company, seeing how it gets done. They see their one company's way of doing it. Or if you're doing a startup, you kind of learn it on the fly. Um, but we really don't teach this. And this is so critical to uh, the success of products. And I've probably seen more products fail than succeed. And they all fail for very similar reasons. So if you kind of look at some of the big ones that we've looked at over the years, I mean, 787 was four years late. Um, that was because it was a supplier, there was a number of reasons, uh, but we had supplier late issues, there was paperwork issues, uh, Smartbook was another device um, that looked great on Kickstarter. Um, they delivered some products, but they had software integration issues. I'm sure we all know about Coolest Cooler. Um, that was materials, there was engineering issues, there was cost issues, there were strikes, there were quality issues, uh, Pebble. Um, Jibo, which actually never delivered, they had a lot of issues with performance and cash, and uh, they just took too long to get into the market, and they were too expensive when they landed there. Tesla was late, Glowforge was late, and if you look at all of these sort of spectacular uh, failures that happened, I mean, obviously, 787 was probably the only one of the, 787 and Tesla were the only two that actually now are working. Um, but that's because they had a lot of cash, like Boeing had a lot of cash to put, ish against, put this against. Um, Tesla had a lot of money to be able to continue um, pumping cash into this process that ended up taking a lot longer than they expected to. These other companies are sort of these failures that occurred because honestly, they just ran out of time and they ran out of money. And a lot of these issues, and I've seen, mo I know most of the folks behind these, um, and they were all very well intentioned. They were all ready to go, but they all made some of these same common mistakes during the product realization process. Um, so a couple of things, just as a note, I mean, we are spending massive amounts of money on startups, um, but be somewhere between 70 and 90% of all startups fail. Um, and those that don't fail are typically one to two years late. Um, 
And those companies have to spend a lot of money to stay on track. So the more you can understand what you're getting into and make sure that you're actually ready to start putting that money against launching that product, the more likely you are to succeed. Um, and so I sort of view product realization as this marathon. Um, it's a very long process. It's incredibly painful. It's incredibly uh, rewarding when you finally finished, but nobody would ever run a marathon without having, oh, this is the Boston Marathon, not the Chicago Marathon. I should have changed the marathon route. Um, so nobody would uh, run the marathon without having at least walked the path before or known, we've got this thing called Heartbreak Hill in Boston, which really uh, derails a lot of runners. Um, but you have to understand that route. You have to train for that route. You have to know what you're getting into before you run that marathon. And so what happens in a lot of cases is companies spend a lot of focus on that first mile. That's the fun part. That's the getting off the kick, you know, off the starting block. You've got a new idea, you're talking to customers, you're raising money, you've got this really cool new prototype, you're in the lab. We're all engineers, we all love to geek out about these things. Um, but this is also where most of our education occurs is on that front end. And I would sort of call this the zero to one problem. How do you go from no idea to a single prototype? We also spend a lot of time focusing on the last half of it. So this is where a lot of our coursework is. It's operations and supply chain and manufacturing and process control. So we teach that back end. Um, so most of those teams are really either really good at the front end or really good at the back end. And again, that failure happens in that middle process. So how do you get to success? Um, one, you have to obviously have a product your customer wants. I mean, that's kind of a given. Um, surprisingly enough, a lot of companies miss on that. We'll talk about this a little bit. But to get there or to have that successful product, it's not just about having something your customer wants. You have to have a mature design. You have to have a design where you have detailed it out enough that the factory can pick it up and actually produce it. It has to have the right target cost. You have to have the right quality and you have to be on time. So all of those four things are incredibly important for those successful products downstream. And if I look at where companies fail, it's usually because they've missed the boat on one of those four things. And a lot of these things, while you can't catch all failures, you can anticipate some of these ahead of time and get ahead of some of these issues. So, um, how many of you guys know about the pilot process? Is this a term uh, that you guys know about? Um, how are you, you guys know what, we mean, what I mean by a pilot process? Laura, are they gonna know, understand a pilot process? I'm sure some will and maybe some won't. So Okay, so we'll go over it. Chat? Okay. Um, Okay, so pilot process. So the way, what happens during product realization is you don't just go from a design to full mass production. There is a step of what we call pilots. And this is the same whether you are producing a small widget or you're producing an airplane or a car or a pharmaceutical, or whatever it is that you do. And these pilot runs are sequenced steps that you go through that allow you to ensure that each of those steps that your product is mature enough to get to that next step. So it's a way of testing out portions of the design or portions of the manufacturing process um, to get to that end stage. And so these answer a set of questions. So the first one is, is your technology ready? So is your design, is your, and this is different from the product design. So is your technology ready? So the first set of tests is really answering that question. The second is, is answering, is your product design ready? Um, and product design is different from CAD. This includes your drawings, your materials, your finishes, all of those things that you have to specify in order to have a successful product all those little nitty gritty details um, that usually you just say, oh, I'm just gonna deal with that later. Um, this is really where that hits. Uh, so you're answering that question. The next set of pilots is around, is your production system ready? So are you 
is your production system or your manufacturing system able to produce that at all? And does the product perform as intended in that production system? And then the final question is, can that production system operate at full volume? And we kind of talk about these stages as being pilots. And so in each pilot, the reason why I wanted to find this is a lot of people who are going into hardware startups are not aware that these pilots have to happen um, independent of how good you think you are and how great you think your technology is, these pilots have to occur at each of these products. Um, and what you wanna make sure is, is that before you start this pilot process, that you have, your product is actually ready to actually answer those questions. So the first thing is obviously your technology readiness, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then once your technology is ready, and that's where your prototyping, your concept prototyping, um, you go through what's called an engineering validation test. Then you go through your design validation testing, your production validation testing, and then mass production and ramp up. Now, this process is incredibly expensive. It is expensive in terms of people, in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of tooling. Because what you're having to do at this point where, where you are starting to quote unquote go into production you have to actually start spending insane amounts of money. This is where the cash starts exiting your bank account. All those millions that you've raised from venture capitalists and angels, this is where you start writing these checks with a lot of zeros. Um, and if your product isn't ready at that point to get into those phases, you can burn through an insane amount of cash very quickly and not start to make progress. And this is why we ask this question. This is that the first part of the seminar series is about, are you actually ready to go into this? Do you have all of those things ready? Do you have all your ducks in your row in order to start to enter this process? Again, cash flow becomes a very big problem at this point. Um, and one of, if you look at a lot of the failures that I talked about in the prior slide, what ends up happening is, is if you look at actually what happened and a bunch of these I'm very familiar with is they weren't ready. They hadn't answered those risk questions we're gonna talk about. They came into the process too early. They started throwing money at it and they basically ran out of money and their customers ran out of patience waiting for that product. Another way, uh, and I just kind of, I always present really key concepts in multiple visuals. So some of us think in some ways and some of us think in other ways. This is another way to sort of think about your, um, the product uh, realization, pro or you think about the pilot process, where as you're going through these steps from concept through to mass production, you're increasing the number of units. So usually it, going to concept design, you're going from a, like a zero to one, when you're going through user testing, you're going up to a five. And then each of these steps as you go through EVT, DVT, PVT, mass production, you're increasing your production rates by orders of magnitude. So you're going from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. Now, if your design isn't ready and the quality isn't there and you build 10,000 products, um, you may have done PVT, but if your product's not ready, you've just wasted all of that sample, all of that time and all those resources. Um, and we do see this where people keep saying, oh, we'll get the technology to work. We'll get it to work. We'll get it to work. And we're, st we're in PVT and they're still struggling with getting that technology stabilized. Um, and again, they're just bleeding cash as they go through that process. Okay, so this is sort of the questions and I, um, I had a really awesome illustrator that worked with me on the book. And so these are some of her illustrations. Uh, she, she just, she made the book actually look interesting which was great because some of it's a little dry. So she, she drove funny pictures throughout the textbook. So you don't fall asleep reading it. Um, but there's a whole series of questions that you really need to ask before you enter this process. Because we all wanna get started, we all wanna, like start building our products. We want to be able to say we're going into production. Um, but it's sort of an analogy that I use also is if anybody's ever painted a room, like the first time you go to paint a room, you're like, oh, I don't need to tape. I can just put paint up on the wall and you get paint everywhere and nothing's cut in correctly. And when you actually go to paint, most of the work is in the prep. Most of the work is making sure that you're ready, that all of your tarps are taped correctly. And I see a couple of people smiling who have probably done this before. You know, you've got the right materials, you've bought everything, you're all set. And actually putting the paint on is actually pretty straightforward. 
Um, and this is it, this is that prep. So the first question is, is your concept ready? Is your technology mature? Is your prototype mature? Is your product definition mature? Is your manufacturing process mature? Do you have enough time? And then do you have enough money? And only after you've answered most of those questions uh, with yes, you kind of might do a, yeah, I think so on one or two of them, but you can't have any no's in any of these before you start that. Because if you start too early, you're gonna get caught out somewhere in that pilot process when you're spending an insane amount of money. You don't wanna have your product definition not be mature, go out and cut a tool, spend $12,000 on a tool, only to discover that you really hadn't thought through that design ahead of time. So mistakes become incredibly expensive as soon as you start to talk to a factory and as soon as you start to cut tooling and as soon as you start to buy samples. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. This is where you hemorrhage money. So anything that you can do to stabilize and mature your product before you start to spend the massive amounts of money, this is the time to do it. So let's go through a couple of these. And I wanna make sure that I leave enough time for some questions at the end. Um, and I'm just checking my clock because of course I don't have that right next to me. Okay. Um, so the first question is, is your concept ready? And there was a question earlier on here about MVP. Um, so this is really that MVP process. And the question is, is, you know, does your product meet a customer need at the right cost at the right price with sufficient margin? So I'm always surprised at how many people say, well, I'm going to go into production, but I don't actually know who my customer is. That should be like alarm bells going off in your head. Um, but also understanding how much is somebody willing to pay for it and can you make money at that business? So you may have the coolest product, somebody may want it, but you can't build it for a price that they're willing to spend on it. So understanding um, your costs and your cost structures and your margins as early as possible is really important. And it can be quite difficult to do that because it's, sometimes it's hard to estimate. But a couple of um, the big failures that we've seen, how many of you guys know about Juicero? I'm sure you've all heard about this company. Um, well, if you don't, if you really wanna have a really good laugh, please go and Google Juicero. Um, but what was interesting about Juicero was is that it was this $700 piece of equipment to take $3 bags of cut fruit to press them to make fresh squeezed juice. And Bloomberg figured out that if you took the bags and you squeezed them by hand, you actually got more juice out of it. Um, plus, I don't know why anybody wouldn't just go to the juice bar and buy the $3 juice as opposed to having all this stuff shipped to you in foam and containers and everything else. But it seemed to be, a, it was the investor's darling until it was not. Um, and it was definitely sort of the emperor has no clothes kind of moment on Juicero. Um, but what it was is that they really hadn't thought through, I mean, they all thought it was cool. All the venture capitalists who had money to spend on $700 pieces of equipment for their kitchens and they had the counter space to have it um, and who bought fresh squeezed juice. Um, they were investing in it, but they never really thought about, did they actually have the customers? And also did they have it at the right cost? to be able to do this. Um, they also had a serious design flaw in it. Another one is Google Glass. That's your classic failure mode on this part where Google Glass was an incredible design. It was really cool, but they didn't have a customer for it. They didn't, it didn't have a meet a need. So one of the things that you wanna be asking yourself at this point is who is your customer? What are the features that are most important to that customer? So if you can't articulate, this is the person who's buying my product. This is the job that needs to be done by this product. These are the features that are the highest priority for that customer. That again, defines your MVP. Um, and what is the value that that product brings to that customer? And then can that customer actually pay for it? So many people, especially if you're doing B2B businesses, Oh, and the, I learned this as a consultant. You need to find out who's writing the check. Because if you don't know who's writing the check, you may be talking to the wrong person. So you have to know who's writing the check. Who is actually buying your product? Not who's using it. 
who is buying your product and what do they care about? Um, and so a lot of times, and I see this happen over and over and over again with tons of industry-based research, you've got a cool idea, it's a really cool technology, and it's a technology going out in search of a customer. And uh, if you've ever watched the movie Field of Dreams, it doesn't work. If you build it, they will not come. Like you've got to go find that customer for that product. Um, and too many times people don't have that sorted out. And I would say that's probably the first, um, whenever I have startup companies come and talk to me, or if I'm, I do a lot of mentoring for like things like Techstars and for Delta V and for a bunch of other programs, um, I would say this is the first point when I'm in, when I'm evaluating potential proposals. If they don't have that clearly defined, this is what they get kicked out almost immediately. Like this to me is a non-starter. If you do not answer yes to this question, you got a lot more work to do. And by the way, please ask questions as you're going. Um, so the next question is, is great. You got a customer, you got a product, you've got a technology. The question also, next question is, is, is the technology that you are incorporating in this mature enough to actually be a product? So is it going to perform reliably? Is it going to be able to perform for any customer? And are there any fundamental flaws with that product? So you may have the greatest story, but if you can't get the technology to work reliably, and you have to remember your prototype that's in the lab is working one time for one person. A product has to work every day for any customer under any circumstances. So all of a sudden reliability becomes incredibly important. So until you can demonstrate that that technology is robust enough to be out alone in the field, sort of like I just sent my kid to college, some things she was robust enough about, some of them like laundry, not so much, but you know, you've got to be able to make sure that product can work reliably in this unknown field. Um, and two ones that were sort of classic failures on that were uh, Dieselgate or the VW case, where they had this great idea of low emissions diesel. It was a great idea. Everybody loved it. It played well. They couldn't get the technology to work. And so they took the illegal route, highly unethical, highly dangerous, not safe route of covering it up, assuming that they could fix that technology later on. And they never were able to. And it cost a huge amount of money and more importantly, did a huge amount of damage to the environment uh, and the product. The other example was the um, uh, EV, which was the first electric vehicle, uh, which would have been great, but the battery technology was not sufficient to be able to actually make it into a reliable long distance car. So ideally, yes, it would have been fantastic, but the technology for both the batteries and then how you charged it, the infrastructure for the charging just wasn't there. And so that product ended up being a flop for that period of time. Now, obviously we see a lot of changes in that electrical vehicle. I'm just gonna read this question. So what could you clarify with substantiates a customer? A customer is somebody who's actually gonna pay you. Um, so, uh, Okay, so end users and buyers are different. Yeah, so if you've ever done like stakeholder, so the question is, uh, perhaps you can clarify what substantiates a customer, not just a target of what you think he wants, uh, and how do you make sure that you're viable in the market? Okay, so I'm an engineer. Um, the whole market analysis and viability of product, I leave to the business school folks. Um, I just know that if, as a person who does a lot of the technical analysis, if somebody can't articulate that and write it down, they don't have a spec document and therefore they don't have a product. Um, and then to uh, for full, um, in terms of how do you differentiate, if you ever look at, there's a whole thing called stakeholder analysis um, and there's a whole bunch of different stakeholders um, in a product, which, and I can't think of them off the top of my head, all of them, but there's the purchaser, the influencer, the decider, the user, and there's one other, I can't remember what the fifth one is, but typically what you do in when you're doing so when i have my students develop specification documents we'll probably talk about in the next session next week um, i actually make sure that you are capturing the voice of the customer and the spec requirements 
for each of those stakeholders in that product. So the first one though, is if you don't have anybody who can put money down, uh, that's kind of a non-starter. Nobody can influence somebody who isn't gonna actually pay for something. So you, you have to at that core understand who's buying that product. And there's a lot more sophistication behind that as well. So if we kind of ask this question on the technology, some of the key ones are, you know, can your components meet the power size, weight, cost budgets? So, I mean, all the budgets that you have in your product, heat, space, power, uh, information flow, size, weight, anything where you've got a budget, do you have, are all the components within your system able to achieve those budgets that mean that it meets the needs of the customer? And this is how that links into that prior question. Um, the next one is, is how much have you tested this in real life scenarios? Have you actually put it out in the wild? Um, how much quality testing have you done? So that's sort of related to the user testing. And then the final one is, is how many unanswered questions are there? How many of these things, how many times a day are you saying, oh, we'll figure that out tomorrow? Or by the way, if anybody says that shouldn't, that technology issue shouldn't be a problem, that to me is always an alarm bell that I need to dig deeper. Uh, because usually that means that um, it is a problem they don't know how to solve and they're just kicking the can down the road and that will end up causing problems later on. Okay, so the next question is, is, is your prototype mature? So you're going to be going through a series of prototypes before you get to that final product right before design. So your prototype has to be very, very close to your final, what we call production intent material. And you have to be able to marry what we call the looks like and the works like prototype. So this is an example. Uh, this is one of my favorite companies in the world. Sam Shames is a very good friend of mine. I've been following them since it looked like on the left. And now actually they just did version two, which looks even better. Um, Ember is a product that actually helps regulate temperature. So it makes you feel cool if you're hot and hot if you're cool. And it's sort of has really interesting uh, effects on sleep and a number of other things. Um, but they knew very early on that their prototype, their works like prototype had to be into the looks like prototype. And they didn't go into production until they made sure those two things were very, very tightly married. Um, and they didn't, they're one of the stories of companies that did a great job. At some point, I wanna get them to be able to let me write up a case study of how they went through the product realization process. Um, but those two products, you have to make sure that prototype, and they actually had a really good prototype of that final product um, before they went into production. So they had made it by themselves using hand-built techniques and really understood how that final product was going to look. And that final pro prototype, the concept prototype, uh, was very close to final production. So you've got to make sure, can you pack all the functionality into the product? Have you prototyped all of the functions in a single unit? It's not a prototype A, B, C, D. It should be easy to get them to work together. Um, and also, do you have a manufacturer's aesthetic and packaging? So can you actually make what your industrial design team has drawn? So the next question after that is, is, is your product definition mature? And what I mean by that is that do you have a comprehensive set of drawings? Uh, everybody know the difference between a, draw, a CAD model and a drawing? Um, so CAD models and drawings are not the same thing. A CAD model is something, it's a geometric representation, a mathematical set of surfaces. That's all it is in CAD and allows you to look at it. And people, especially uh, people who haven't done drawings before, get a false sense of security that because it looks good in CAD and renders that it's actually manufacturable. In order to get your product into manufacturing, you have to create a set of drawings and those drawings need to be manufacturable. Um, they need to have all the detailing, all your fillets, all your radiuses, all of your dimensioning, all of your tolerances, everything has to be in there because a manufacturer can't use a CAD file they have to use a drawing um, and those two things. And if you don't understand the difference between a CAD file and a drawing, um, you need to go out and look that up because you have to be able to create drawings for the manufacturing. 
Do you have a list of bill of materials? Do you have a comprehensive bill of materials that has every single part, including everything, including tape, your glue, the sticky that's going inside of it, um, every little tiny spring and gasket. You have to have a complete definition of that product. And you learn a lot again from that prior one on your prototypes. And then do you have a complete spec document and quality test plan? Have you said, what are you gonna build and how are you going to test it? So all of those documents together define how that product is going to be made. And you have to have all of these, you have to have your drawings, your bill of materials, your spec document, your quality test plan completed before a factory will talk to you. Um, and people think that that's something, there's a lot of work that goes into getting all those documents just right. So a couple of questions to ask, have you supply, have you identified all your suppliers? Have you identified all the manufacturing? Do you know how every part in that product is going to be made? Um, because what's gonna happen is you're going to design, if you don't, you're gonna design a part, you're gonna think it can be made using process A, it's gonna to have to be redesigned because you can't make it. And then it's gonna have this incredible ripple effect through the whole product. So classic example of this was uh, working on a product, a launch product, it's a great company now. Um, they had a flex circuit uh, in their product and they had this beautiful symmetric tablet kind of thing and the top and the bottom were exactly the same size and it, was, it fit just into an eight and a half by 11 uh, piece of paper. So aesthetically it had to be exactly that and everything was just right. And they figured out that they thought the flex circuit could just be bent in half and they didn't realize the flex circuit actually had a turning radius. Um, and because of that, they didn't have enough room in the housing to make the product. So we, they didn't understand all of those details about the fact that the flex circuit actually had a bending radius and wiring harnesses catch out companies all the time. And this is why you have to have that mature uh, product definition uh, and luckily they were able to jig it, but there was a lot of panic, huge amount of panic. Another company that I talk about in the book, um, there's a whole story about, um, is, uh, it was an intercom system and the issue they had with the camera. Um, so question, CAD programs, do you like to use experience? That, I, I'm, I'm CAD agnostic, by the way, uh, for the person who's asking about the CAD. Um, I really don't care they all work well. I mean, if I have to do something quickly, I always use Onshape because the tutorials are great. And if I can't, um, uh, if I need to learn something, they have the best tutorials and I can get up to speed as quickly as I can. So I like Onshape, plus I don't have to keep the software uploaded. So I, I tend to play with them, um, but there's any number of ones. Uh, Greg asked the question, what is the best response to somebody who decides on a non-working functionality is not needed to move forward? Well, I think that's when you have to go back to your customer. So this is why it's so important to have that definition of your customer ahead of time. So if you don't have your customer needs clearly defined, who is your customer? What do they care about? What are their priorities? You don't have a basis for making decisions as to whether or not a function is gonna be important or not. So you have to do that work ahead of time. And this is why the spec document, the specification document is so important to be able to write down who is your stakeholder, what is their voice? What do they care about? And how does that translate into the needs of the product? So everybody's working from the same set of assumptions about it. And there are some times when you do have to kind of jettison a function, but that's, you have to go then back to that, um, that touchstone, which is what is that voice of that customer and how you're gonna do that. Okay. So the next one is, is, is your manufacturing process mature enough? So if you have anything where you've got a new manufacturing process or one that you have not used before, um, this is a huge opportunity to mess up. Um, because while the parts may look obvious, uh, there's a, there are incredible complexities in new manufacturing processes and sp specifically in scaling of new manufacturing processes. So going from a process that can build one an hour to building one that can build a hundred an hour um, can completely snarl a factory. And so a couple of examples um, of those that I've encountered, the one on the left, I'm very familiar with the one on the right, I've just learned about through New York Times and things. So the one on the left is um, a company GTAT who built, uh, grew Sapphire 
uh, for, uh, they were originally gonna do it for Apple. So Apple was gonna have an all Sapphire cover on their phones. Um, and this company was building, when I was working with them, they were building a uh, bull sort of in the 30 kilogram size. And they promised Apple that they could build them in 200 kilogram size. And they really didn't appreciate uh, what it was gonna take to scale their manufacturing from 30 to 200. Um, and as a result, they were unable to scale it, but Apple required the 200 kilogram size to get a big enough piece of Sapphire to be able to put that on the screen. And I think that may have been the only 200 uh, kilogram bool that didn't crack that actually is in that picture. Most of them look like shattered glass because as you grow that size, the way this works is you basically take ALO2, you melt it, um, and you then grow that crystal very, very slowly. Um, and from what I understand, when you go from the small to the larger bull sizes, you end up having incredible thermal stresses in them. And those thermal stresses become much more difficult to manage. And all of this is, none of this is under my NDA. Uh, this is all publicly available. You can read about that case study. It's a very interesting case study on scaling and manufacturing processes. Uh, the other one was Tesla. We've all been hearing about this. A lot of their problems from what I understand is, is that um, as Tesla began to produce these parts and produce the cars, as they scaled, they just couldn't run as fast as they thought they could. And a lot of that became because they didn't have standard parts, they had a lot of rework. And as they sped that line up, um, they uh, just couldn't keep up with it. It just, it snarled and broke down too much. And in fact, uh, Elon Musk had a great uh, Twitter thing about saying, um, I never thought too much anima automation would be bad, but I've discovered that people actually do things better. I forgot exactly the exact quote, but he basically said, look, I shouldn't have done so much automation because we couldn't, the processes just weren't stable enough. Um, and they had to actually back off on the automation, run it manually until they could get the automation up and running. And so those are sort of two examples of some pretty, um, uh, big stories that have been in the press about processes that just didn't scale. Um, and as a result, Elon Musk had a lot more money. Apple kind of gave up on the Sapphire at some point, but you really have to ask that question. Like what happens to my process and the, what happens physically to that process as I scale? What happens as I run at higher speeds? Can I reliably build at high quality because I may get it to work once, but how many of those batches are going to be bad? So you have to be able to answer those questions. The next one is, is do you have enough time? And this is one where you want to be answering this question as early as possible. You don't want to um, overpromise how fast you can do things. And this is where understanding the pilot process is really important. How long is each cycle going to take? How many are you likely going to have? And can you actually meet your delivered promised times? Because you don't want to have to go out and beg forgiveness from your customer. Um, this is a cl classic example. Glowforge is finally working now. Um, but uh, this was back until, I think it was a quote from 2016. I think they're just now producing at full volumes. They've been promising this product for years and years and years and years. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why it went horribly wrong. Um, but they, as a result, delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, yes, so Tesla had issues with Cal OSHA that impacted scale and speed and safety. Yeah, so uh, A. Jones, thank you. That's, ex that's also another issue um, with them. And it had to do with scale. So have you asked all those questions about safety? And safety, by the way, is never negotiable. <laughs> and then finally, do you actually have enough money? Have you really looked at uh, your cash flow requirements, what are your COGS, your cost of goods, uh, what is going to be your tooling, what are your other NREs, non-recurring engineering, what are those things that you have to spend to get that product going, and do you have a full list of what you're going to need to spend at each of those phases so you actually have enough cash flow, and I would say, I used to use the phrase, the leading cause of startup death is cash flow, um, and so the classic one of that was the coolest cooler case. Uh, they, at the core, it was a cash flow issue. They just couldn't generate enough cash off of the sales um, to be able to support the next set of builds. So understanding cash flow um, 
first of all, sort of what does it take to get that first product out? And then how are you going to manage cash flow once you're in production? And this is where your cost of goods and your margins come into play. So pay, really closely paying attention to that as well. Now, sort of as a, um, if you, you're never going to answer yes to all of those questions. There's always going to be some questions that you're going to go, eh. if it's a clear no, then you got to go back to it. But if you kind of got a, well, it's the only one, like, what do you do? Because nothing is, you can't be perfect. Perfection is the enemy of completion. You're going to go into these products with some unknowns as you go. And my recommendation would be manage your risk. Understand what that risk is, look at it, figure out how you're gonna manage it, proactively track it, pay attention to it, put in mitigation plans. And then after you've done that, go back and look at your risks and manage them again, and then manage them again and manage them again. So again, in using that analogy of that marathon, you may not know if you can make it to the end, but you know where you need to take water breaks, you know when you need to check up on your cramping, you know you need to have a certain amount of food, so you manage those risks as you go through it. Uh, head in the sand is never a good approach to this. So the more honest you can be about where your risks are, things where you've answered no, where you might not be ready, but then put in those plans to be able to handle those as you go into that process. Um, this is just sort of a list of the outline, and this is just, one talk on one of the chapters of the textbook uh, that I talked about at the beginning. Um, you know, are you ready to start? Uh, but a lot of these topics, and I've thrown out a lot of acronyms and names and titles and, and phases, you probably are feeling a little bit overwhelmed, uh, which is normal. Um, I do have a, a website that um, I think Laura typed in there where I've got glossaries of terms where you can. Um, Look it up. I also have a ton of spec documents, bill of material, templates, and things like that on that website that I've just published for people. Um, my students use them all the time, so I just made them publicly available for anybody who um, wants to. Yes, and please buy the book. That'd be great. Um, so anyway, there's a whole bunch of different topics, um, which include things like, you know, how do you write a quality test plan? Um, how do you decide who your suppliers are going to be? Um, how do you actually do early cost estimates and how do you do cash flow analysis? So these are all the things that before you go into production or before you start this process, it's a good idea to understand and know before you walk into it. Okay, so finished with 10 minutes, just nine minutes to spare. Um, so I think we'll just, uh, anybody has questions? I don't see any questions just yet, but I did want to remind everyone, I did put this in the chat, but we're lucky enough that uh, Anna will be joining us next week for part two of this workshop. So um, be sure to check that one out too. So lots of information, great, uh, lots of great charts. And as I mentioned too, we will have the recording of this on our YouTube channel shortly. So thank you. Anna, I imagine a lot of folks think about all the ideal steps they could go through to de-risk and get closer to the steps you outlined, but cash flow is always an issue, as you'd said. What are some of the key things in these early steps that you think you, that somebody can do as an entrepreneur who's got an early hardware prototype that aren't going to break the bank and prevent them from moving forward? Um, so I guess the question is, is um, there's a couple of things that people can do to do risk. One is, is you can actually use low volume prototyping methods for your first set of runs. So this is something that we do all the time where we might, instead of doing an injection molding and spending money on injection molding, we might do a urethane casting. So quality surface finish is not gonna be quite so good. They're a little bit more expensive. Uh, you might have some UV resistance issues. But if you replace your uh, urethane casting tools or parts uh, with injection molding, it doesn't affect your um, certification requirements. So you can actually change between those two materials and it shouldn't affect your certifications. So there's a whole thing about if you have any electromechanical, uh, any electrical um, parts to your product, you have to go through FCC, UL, and a number of other safety certifications. Um, and you always want to make sure that if you are launching a product with lower volume production methods, 
um, that when you change to the higher volume production methods, that you don't lose your certification and have to recertify. So I would say you can make some of those changes where you can go to a lower risk, lower non-recurring engineering cost methods early on. Um, and, but, but you have to make sure that that's not gonna affect your safety uh, certification requirements. So if you have, for example, any fire safety, um, temperature resistance, toy standards or things like that, then it, then you have to be much more sensitive to it. If it's a, if it's a classic electronics in a box, uh, which is basically all a phone is an electronics in a box, um, then you don't have to worry about that. And that's really where you wanna learn about your certifications. What is your product? What is your product class, et cetera. So you have to go out and learn those things. So I would say the big cash flow issues that I see is, is where people buy tooling um, so those are the things that you buy to be able to make all the injection molded parts and all of your form parts and everything else. You go out and you buy those tools and then you have to chuck them or you spend a whole bunch of money on a set of samples to make them perfect. And then you have to chuck it because they don't actually work or you are, you go into a pilot process and you have, you're not quite ready. Um, so I would say those are the big areas where people lose money. And then anything that you can do to understand your bill materials and your parts and get as close as possible to production intent drawings as early as possible, you can start to get much more accurate cost quotes uh, for those parts. And nowadays it's great. There's all these software programs like Proto Labs has got a ton of stuff online. You can put your CAD file in and they'll give you a free estimate um, for those parts at relatively low volumes, uh, but you can at least get an understanding of you know, it's not a, uh, it's, it might be a $3 part, it's not a $100 part. Um, so I think going out, I think understanding your cost of goods, talking to suppliers, and then seeing if you can do some substitution strategies. Great. I think Dr. Jones has a question for you for Dr. Horton. Um, so, so. It says, are there points in your book to help companies developing a SaaS product that can be deployed on a product already in the market for education? Okay, so uh, the product, the book is actually just hardware. It's not, and there's no software side. I am, my limit on software is helping my daughter debug her code. <laughs> That's about it. So in terms of the uh, software service, my recommendation on that one would be to um, look at Eric Reese's book on agile product development. I would say his, uh, that's probably the best book on software uh, development and getting products out. So anybody wanna throw in the, the chat sort of what kind of products you guys are working on or? I think we may have people hopping off because we're about okay. at the top of the hour. Oh, right, but, okay, uh... okay, it's 157, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm used to an hour and a half class so my head is on an hour and a half lecture cycle. Um, so anyway, please feel free to reach out to me. You're welcome to link in with me to LinkedIn. Um, I'll just type that there. And then the uh, website is product realization. So feel free to use any of those resources there and reach out with any questions. Great, thank you so much, Anna. We look forward to getting to see you again next week. I know, so. I know. I, I got to get out to Chicago. I've got all these companies that I hang out with in Chicago. So I've got a, a, a bunch of people I need to visit. All right. Well, you're welcome here anytime. So we look forward to making that happen at some point. So we will, uh, we will see you next week. Thanks to everyone who joined us today and have a great afternoon, everyone. Yeah. And oh, by the way, if there are questions, if you're coming next week and you have questions you specifically want me to focus on, send me an email or send me a note through LinkedIn or send a note to Laura or Kathy um, and they can get that message to me. I have not written that presentation yet. I'm just in time. Great, thank you so okay. much. Thanks so much.